ओम तव कथात तप्त जीवन कविरीडित कलमशापहम श्रवण मंगल श्रीमदात भुवि गृणंती ये भूरीदा जना so we were discussing the gospel of sri ram krishna part 2 and the conversation was dated 8th april 1883 so the topic that was being discussed in our previous class was what does company of sadhus do and what does it mean for householders and what is true poverty is it lack of money that is poverty or lack of spiritual values to sustain oneself is that known as poverty so sri ram krishna is discussing and this is the sub heading given by m <clears throat> company of sadhus essential for householders and who is truly poor <clears throat> so this is the topic of today's discussion though the conversation is going on we remember if you remember last time the conversation was on ego we discussed how <clears throat> till the hamba hamba becomes tuhu tuhu the cow the suffering of the cow or the suffering which a uh, cow or bullock undergoes does not come to an end so the, similarly in one spiritual life if the ego doesn't get a nice battering and if the ego is not subdued till that time till such time that the person or the spiritual aspirant voluntarily renounces the ego and says to who to who the lord subjects him to all these tests so uh, and true peace and joy could be found only if one surrenders one's ego to the supreme ego of the lord who is the ruler of the universe who is sachidananda himself and when we do that we get our true rest because then we don't depend on our little labels and the little egos that have given us these different labels labels are known as upadis there is a beautiful word upadi actually in bengali or any vernacular Uh, language in even in hindi uh, it it means trouble the literal meaning is something else but when you say upadhi mat karo or upadhi karo na in bengali means don't create troubles though upadhi means just a label so it is a synonym for trouble so anything which limits our existence and we depend too much on those labels they are the source of future sorrow though the label may be very nice sometimes uh, sri ram krishna used to give an example he says there was a and strangely <laughs> it this here also sri ram krishna gives that example that once there was a frog and he was afraid because the place where he lived the little hole where he lived uh, was very near a pond normally frogs live near ponds so they are they are afraid that the elephant which comes most of the elephants who come to take bath in the pond they sometimes might trample them if they are just outside their house or maybe they can trample the whole house <clears throat> so the frogs were always afraid and they were praying to the lord that please see that the one of the foot of the mighty foot of the elephant doesn't trample our little home and they were full of fear but one day sri ram krishna gives this example suddenly somebody drops a gold coin and the frog finds that gold coin and takes it to its hole and then he says the frog started feeling very proud so next time an elephant came earlier they used to run out of fear but this time he thought he has got a gold coin and he has become a very big person 
So Sri Ramakrishna says, see what Upadhi does to a person. And that frog started croaking loudly. Of course, the elephant did not even bother because so many croaks it is hearing. It is crushing so many uh, frogs under its feet. So it doesn't bother whose croak it is and who is croaking. But that frog thought, my croak, now because I have a beautiful coin, golden coin, I've become a rich man. And now I can shout, I can assert my authority, not knowing that compared to the elephant, it's still a frog. It may have a coin. So Sri Ramakrishna used to say, that is what Upadhi does. It brings a false sense of pride. No matter how powerful it is, even the most powerful monarch, uh, Alexander, when he was about to die, he just showed his raised palm to his colleagues, to his soldiers who accompanied him and unfortunately died on the way back. He could not even reach Greece after having conquered half the world. Then he just showed his arm with a uh, handful of soil which he had clutched very and saying this is all that is left of my conquest and when i am dying i am going to take only this much he could not speak because he was too tired too exhausted to even give this advice but the parting advice they say of course it might be just a story but it is very illustrative of what happens <clears throat> he, see, he was just holding that little soil he says i conquered so much miles and miles of land and now you see fortune is taking away everything and even the land which is in my fist ultimately when I die even that will be buried with me. So that is what Sri Ramakrishna conveys through this parable that just possessing one coin accidentally the frog thought he has earned a treasure and a fortune and has become a big man and with that little upadi which for that frog was a big thing it really meant nothing compared to that elephant, uh, it was nothing. So what Sri Ramakrishna here says that this ego is the cause of upadhis. Upadhi means trouble. If upadhi literally means a label. Upadhi means you are known by that particular label, that you are a rich man, you are a poor man, you are a sick man. These are all upadhis. So upadhi also means in the vernacular trouble. So all these labels are full of troubles because to live up to those labels, you have to, as they say, the English proverb goes, to keeping up with the Joneses. You have neighbors who are having a particular brand of car and you think you have a smaller car. So you to keep up with your neighbors, you have to buy an expensive car. That is how the competition forces a person, these upadis, that a person with a big car, a person with a small car, uh, that is an indication. So Sri Ramakrishna makes, he will give a, some wonderful examples. And later on, he explains what this Upadhi does. And he says, you have to be like the Chataka bird. Chatak is a bird which does not drink water, which has already fallen on the ground. That is what worldly people do. We just try to gather whatever whatever gross things we get. But Chataka bird is always on a high plane. It can soar at high altitudes. And it drinks water only when the rain drops, from the rain drops directly. It doesn't mind waiting. It doesn't drink cheap, dirty water. So Sri Ramakrishna is saying that only when you become lowly, you can rise. So farming is not possible at high elevations. You see, just as Ram Krishna gives another example, saying that if a farmer decides to do farming, the rain may come, but it will all go down the slope. So most of the farming is done in uh, low land, low lands. So water collects only on low land. So whoever is humble and who is not, uh, whose ego is not swelled up with pride, only for him, true spirituality is possible. Then comes the, the next topic. Sri Ramakrishna is still continuing, but here M gives a new heading to the rest of the conversations. And then he says, one should take a little trouble to seek the company of the holy. Because at home, one only talks of worldly matters. And there is one 
there is always one ailment or the other. I mean, as long as you are influenced by these upadis and you have people with these upadis around you, you are always mixing with them. Some ailment will be there. Somebody will complain about this. I have less money. I have more money. I have then competition comes. There's so many upadis, and when you live with people who have these upadis and who uh, have these labels, and then you quarrel about your label or the other's label. So they always have one ailment or the other because of these upadis. Then there is another example Sri Ramakrishna gives. The parrot says Rama, Rama, only when it settles on a perch. But while filing, fly, flying to the jungle, it only squawks, squacks. I mean, when it is really faced with a problem, it, it does not remember its uh, spiritual nature or maybe it, its elevated nature and the good things that it has been taught. Rama Rama means where the parrots are normally taught. Suppose they live in a very good household. Uh, where there is a lot of devotional discussion going on. You will find those parrots very easily pick up all the wonderful verses of the Bhagavata and even the chanting of the holy name. If Rama has been chanting, has been chanted in that house for a long time, the tendency is that parrot will repeat Rama, Rama. But that is only if it is perched in a place where it is exposed to these sounds. So that explains the importance of satsanga. But when it is flying through the jungle, where it meets a variety of people, it can only squawk. Now, then Sri Ramakrishna says, money does not make a man great. A sign of a wealthy man is light in every room. The poor do not have money to spend on oil, so they can't have that many lights. You see, one must not keep the temple of he is saying it in a figurative way. The body should not be in darkness. One must hear the lamp doesn't mean the physical lamp. Just having a lot of lamps, a bright house full of expensive lights is not the way. He says one, at the cost of the darkness which is enveloping one's body, one must light the lamp of jnana or knowledge. Knowledge is always compared to light. That which shows you in a very uh, clear way, what is the path one should follow to get eternal joy and peace and happiness. So the light of lamp of Jnana in the house and see the face of Brahma Mai. There is a song, uh, one of the po poets, Bengali poets, he sings. The Brahma Mai means one who is bliss, the blissful mother of the universe. So the shaktas they sing that my uh, by the grace of my Brahma Mai, I can see the face. Right now I'm not seeing her face, seeing the face of my Ista because there is a darkness inside. So how can I expect to see the face? But the moment knowledge comes, the light of Jnana, not the knowledge, secular knowledge, but the spiritual knowledge dawns, then everything is illuminated, illumined in the heart. Yesterday we discussed in a holy Mother's life, what is the oh, sorry in the Raj Yoga class? We discussed what it means. Sri Ramakrishna says, Jyotish Mati means the light which clears all misunderstandings, clears all doubts, and gives you a conviction of the uh, <clears throat> truth of spiritual uh, things. That is what you should meditate upon. Or if you can't meditate on that light, at least meditate on the heart of a person. Who has seen that light and who has that kind of bliss within, uh, who uh, can transmit that bliss? So when we meditate on such people, you will automatically uh, get that light yourself. That is the meaning. So the topic now is real meaning of prayer. What are the marks of spiritual awakening? Now, how, do, how does one know what should one pray for? And what, what does prayer really do to a human being, to an aspirant? So, Sri Ramakrishna gives a lot of hope, saying everyone can attain jnana. It's not that only certain privileged people can attain jnana. There is the individual self and the supreme being. There is, the with the limitations, Shiva becomes Jiva. With the Upadis, 
Shiva is without any upadhi. He is the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-blissful. There are so many adjectives. But the moment you limit it, then the individual self starts thinking of its own limitations and gets suffocated or gets contracted as it were. Though the Supreme Being is very much present. So the more one focuses on the Supreme Being, and that should be the goal of prayer. So one must pray to God for what? That one can be united with that Supreme Self and not stay content with being one with the individual self, which is so much full of sorrow and because of these upadis. These restrictions, uh, these upadis are harmful because they, if you identify with these upadis, like I am so and so, I am doing this, I am doing that. And if you don't, uh, we don't get, because it is a temporary thing, a label, the moment that label goes away, a person feels sorrow. Because he has, he is chasing limited labels which are transient in nature. For example, Sri Ram Krishna used to say that when you are, uh, you are the master of some company, people will all salute you. But the moment you leave the chair, moment that label of the mass, that authority, the label of authority which you had, the moment it is taken away from you, uh, people don't even look at you. So, Sri Ram Krishna says, why should one pray to God? Because that is the supreme label. If you connect yourself somehow to God, what happens? So, Sri Ram Krishna gives a beautiful example based on the technology that was available at that time. In those days, the British government had introduced gas pipes. So if you want, wanted light instead of burning oil lamps, which was an old method of illuminating the house, they had fitted some houses in Calcutta, especially those who can afford that to apply to the company and they used to call it a gas company. And then they will be supplied gas through these pipes so that the flame in their house always was burning. And that way they could, the electricity was perhaps not discovered. And instead of electric light, you had gas lamps. So Sri Ram Krishna says, connecting yourself with the Supreme Self is like connecting yourself to the gas company. Then you will never short of light. But the moment your connection goes away, the lamp goes away. The light, there's no light. There's darkness. So every house, like every body, is fitted with these gas pipes. Which, are, which one must apply to the gas company to receive the gas. So Sri Ram Krishna says, you take so much trouble. You have to apply, you have to file an application, pay the charges, then only they will come and connect you and then you will get light. So when you file an application, Sri Ram Krishna knew the procedure and you see how nicely he is explaining. The company will arrange for the gas and your house will be lit. The company has its office in Sierra. So everybody laughs because... Uh, though he said it jocularly that uh, you have to connect, but he gave a very, very wonderful example asking what happens if you connect yourself to God. It's like connecting yourself to the company, the gas company. The more if you connect yourself to the gas company, then you'll get gas and then you'll get the light also. So that's how some people may become illumined, Sri Ramakrishna says. They have a special mark. What are the signs of people who have applied and got the gas connection? So he says they have a special mark. Like you get a special uh, certificate that you have applied. This is your connection number. And this is the period during which you will be supplied with the gas. So there's so many conditions you have to fulfill after which you start getting the light. So he says some people may become illumined. They have a special mark. How to identify them, whether they are connected or not. They do not like, they don't like to hear anything but words about the Lord. They don't like to talk of anything but the Lord. Take, for example, the seven seas, the rivers of the Ganges and the Jamuna. They are all full of water. They may be full of water, but the Chatak bird wants only the raindrops. It is dying of thirst, but it will not drink any other water. That means there may be so many wonderful things in Prakriti, which 
may distract your attention but a true seeker he will not be happy with the little things he knows the value the transient value of the upadis just like the chataka bird which tricks they say which uh, drinks only the rain drops so it will rather wait to drink the rain drop than drink or even bear the thirst it may be dying of thirst but it will just wait to till the best water the rain drops fall and only that pure water it drinks it does not drink any water so what sri ram krishna is saying though you may be living in the world you don't like to you are very selective you try to as far as possible listen to only words about the lord about your connection about your connection with the lord how to pray to him how to get connected easily just as you apply to a gas company and get your connection so how one can get connected with the lord that engages one's own whole attention or at least a major part of the day or a major uh, concern in one's life is to how to develop that attitude with which one can have a sort of permanent connection just as you get a permanent connection then you don't have to worry about the gas now the next chapter is sri ram krishna and other singh sri ram krishna in samadhi so that is the next chapter sri ram krishna asks somebody is still there the it's same 8th april 1883 but the scene has changed a little bit after giving all this advice he asks somebody to sing now and then sri ram krishna used to convey many things through songs because the songs have one wonderful feature or one wonderful power to transform the minds of people it has not only thought but it has emotion so you need some kind of because if thinking feeling and willing and the action they all come together then a some strong samskara is formed that's why if you just read books your intellect maybe uh, it will get some exercise but you will not grow in spiritually because you are not emotionally attached to that so that's why they say along with gyana you should have a little bhakti of course gyana means love for knowledge if it is there then that emotion also will help but very often than not if you are not emotionally attached to the thoughts you think and just take them superficially and just go through those words as if you are studying some textbook to pass some exams that's what most of us do when we study the shastras we just want to know out of curiosity oh what does this upanishad says say then you say oh on the youtube there are some beautiful lectures i have heard that then you feel a sort of uh, it becomes a upadi rather than giving you a solution oh he has heard five talks or he has understood or mastered this five upanishads whereas i have just mastered one so you chase that uh, uh, intellectual study and in the process you neglect the emotional attachment you don't get attached to the ideas of the upanishads nor do you try to act upon them but just are satisfied take up one upanishad finish it take up another upanishad finish it take up gita finish it and then you are happy if you have just covered all these upanishads and on the intellectual plane of course one third of the force comes through thinking but if feeling and willing the will power if these two things are not attached to the thought the wonderful thoughts of the gita and upanishads or whatever scripture you follow if the feeling is not accompanied Uh, if the thinking is not accompanied by feeling and also will power then they don't create a samskara so sri ram krishna used to say if you sing what happens the emotions that are aroused because of the wonderful tune music has that wonderful capacity or poetry has that wonderful capacity to rouse the wonderful feelings of man <coughs> so he not only thinks but he feels he feels the beautiful song so you, that's why you see when people who are not very intellectual by nature the moment you sing they start dancing especially young children or even the tribal people who are not very intellectual you ask them 
or try to expound some theory, they get bored. But the moment they hear a good song, a deeply spiritual song, their spiritual sensitivities are enlivened. So with many people, it is their thinking accompanied by feeling and then appropriate action based on those thought is the best way to create samskara. So Sri Ram Krishna is asking somebody to sing. Ram Lal who was a good singer himself. He was a uh, Sri Ram Krishna's brother's son. Ram Lal and a Brahmin Brahmachari. What Brahmin Brahmachari means? I think uh, it was they have not given the name. Uh, oh, he was an unmarried Brahmin in not in the sense of caste. It's not in the sense of caste. Here it means a Brahmachari who is not married. He is also known as Brahmin. Really speaking. A person who pursues uh, celibacy, practices celibacy, Brahmin Brahmachari of the Kali temple, they are singing with Banya. Banya is an instrument. Banya uh, is an instrument which is like a semicircular instrument played along with tabla. It's like a stringed instrument. So somebody is playing that and they are singing accompanied by these two instruments with the tabla. The song is O Kamlapati, the lover of Bhakti. What Kamlapati means is the husband of Kamala. Kamala is goddess Lakshmi. It has come from the word Kamala. Kamala is lotus. Kamala means one who is sitting on the lotus. So if you see, goddess Lakshmi is always shown as sitting on the lotus. And Vishnu is lying on the uh, Sheshanaga. And then from his uh, uh, Nabhi, you can see uh, the lotus on the top of the lotus is Lakshmi sitting there. So that's why she is also known as Kamala. The word Kamala has come from Kamal. Kamal is lotus. The husband of Kamala is uh, goddess Lakshmi. He is Kamala Pati. Pati means husband. So Vishnu, is, they are addressing Vishnu with this song. So Kamala is Lakshmi. And Kamalapati is the husband of Lakshmi who is Vishnu and is the lover of Bhakti. If you dwell in the Vrindavan of my heart, my devotion to you will be like that of Chestrada. So the singer is saying, you just have to come and sit in my heart so that I can uh, pray to you or my devotion to you will be like the Chestrada. So chastity here is insisted upon. The idea of chastity, Radha was able to understand what prema was or what bhakti was because of her pure nature. So my devotion to you, so this naturally these brahmacharis are singing and he says my devotion to you will be like that of chaste Radha. My wish for liberation will be like the milkmaids and my body will be like the village of Nanda. My love will be that like that of mother Yashoda. So they are trying to sing with the feeling. They are meditating on the different characters associated or different devotees associated with Sri Krishna or Vishnu. So just as the milkmaids loved you and the body, the Nanda, the village of Nanda where Sri Krishna grew up. So my whole body will be like the village of Nanda. That means Whatever I do with my different sense organs and the entire body will be like a play of Sri Krishna in this town of Nanda, that village of Nanda. And my love will be that, like that of Mother Yashoda. Now Yashoda was a central character. Though Sri Krishna was a son of Devaki, he was born to Devaki as the biological mother was Devaki. But he loved and not only loved uh, Mother Yashoda, but Yashoda also loved him more than she would have done her, loved her own biological child. So that's why they compare the highest vatsalya bhava, the highest love of a mother towards the child. The, uh, the love which Yashoda had for Krishna was something similar. Hold me, hold me, O Janardana, lift the Mount Govardhan of the weight of my sins. So this is a symbolic plea or an appeal made to Govardhana. said, you could lift the whole Govardhana to protect other people. So can you not just lift a little 
weight of my sins no doubt i have co co committed a lot of sins but you can definitely lift the weight of my sins with on your tiny fingers kill quickly the six messengers of kamsa so there are six messengers just as sri krishna killed the different demons or uh, kamsa and all the other demons so the demons of lust and anger jealousy and all those things are the messengers of kamsa kamsa was the uh, main demon who was whom he wanted to kill because kamsa was very keen to kill krishna even before he was born so he was but somehow krishna escaped to uh, and was given shelter in gokula under the care loving care of yashoda and his mother who was imprisoned <clears throat> she had to suffer a lot and kamsa in trying to kill krishna because he had heard there was a prophecy that krishna would be responsible for his death but in fact it happened the so kamsa is compared to something that destroys your spirituality so you unless you kill quickly the messengers of kamsa like lust and other things other uh, shudder ipu they are known as six enemies of a human being uh, so those are jealousy envy anger pride and uh, kama that is lust so all these things six enemies of a human being they have to be quickly killed and they are compared like compared to the messengers of kamsa so before kamsa comes all these messengers come so if, unless you destroy that you can't think of destroying kamsa himself then he says play on your flute of grace so the beautiful tune which sri krishna used to play when he was in uh, doing his ras leela with all the gopis who were practically given their life they led such wonderful pure lives and they sacrificed their everything they even give up their husbands and others and try to follow krishna they were the flute of his grace they say it's the wonderful sound of the flute was something which they yearned for day and night the flute would ring in the groves of brindavan and sri krishna used to play and attract all the gopis so here the poet says i pray uh, please play on the flute uh, play on the flute of your grace and tame the cows of my mind so even the cows leave alone the <clears throat> gopis even the cows the wild cows who used to go here and there hearing the sound of the flute they all would come and it was easy for this gopalas who were tending these cows to control the la the big cows and the other animal cattle they were taking for <clears throat> they had taken to the forest so they also were attracted by the wonderful the flute of grace of sri krishna so then he says the pasture of my heart my heart is like a pasture where the cows are grazing here and there that means my thoughts are going here and there but the moment i come in touch with the flute of your grace the flute of the the, the grace of krishna then the cows of my mind they just come and focus themselves at one point in the heart that is the pasture they don't go here and there they are satisfied with the pasture wonderful pasture they have found in within the heart and then i can have a glimpse of my ideal the ultimate ideal of uh, supreme devotion dwell now and ever more with your heart full of affection for your servant under the vanshivatta <coughs> vanshivatta means uh, it is known as uh, a banyan tree vatta means it is a vatta uh, vatta ruksha vanshi means the banyan tree under which krishna played his flute so krishna used to play a flute uh, standing under a banyan tree which later on got the name vanshi vatta vatta means vatta ruksha is the banyan tree vanshi means banshi banshi is the flute so please dwell there and have affection for your servant under the vanshi vatta of hope means that banyan tree is my hope so that 
here a nice figurative way saying just as krishna used to stand and attract all these cows gopis and all in the grove of brindavan sitting under or standing under that uh, tree what a vruksha that banyan tree similarly you also with your heart full of affection you dwell here like krishna did and saved the gopis you also do and uh, have your heart full of affection for a servant like me if you say that you are a prisoner of love of the cowards of braja then this dasharathi dasharathi is the person who has composed this poem he said if you if you think because sri krishna had claimed or rather there is a saying that god gives mukti to all but does not give bhakti because god as it were has to become a prisoner if your love is so deep like the radha and the other gopis and the gopalas the the coward boys they loved sri krishna so much that he was bound by their love so he becomes a prisoner as it were bound by the love of the cowards of braja so this dasharathi i mean the poet says i am that cowherd uh, bereft of all spiritual knowledge i am just as foolish or as innocent like those coward boys will become a coward and your slave i am ready to become a cow cowherd and uh, just as those simple minded uh, gopis and the simple minded uh, gopalas they they came in uh, attracted by the flute of your grace even i i am who does i who do not i do not have spiritual knowledge but by coming attracted by the grace of your wonderful flute the flute under that vamshi vatta vatta vruksha banyan tree i just give me shelter under your uh, under your care and i want to become dasharathi says i want i who do not have any spiritual knowledge i'm seeking that so that is the prayer then there is another song this song was actually sung by the two ramlal and the other person the brahmachari and sri ram krishna is listening to this song then there was another song also on krishna what value has the new cloud in comparison to the moon like face of the beloved sham now this is poetry uh, where the poet when he sees the cloud he is reminded of the skin color krishna as all of you know had a dark complexion unlike balrama who was fair krishna was always was all is always depicted as krishna the word itself means dark of dark color krishna shukla means white shukla paksha and krishna paksha so krishna is always but that beautiful darkness has been compared to the new cloud a new cloud which is gray and which is grayish in color slightly dark in color it looks so beautiful against the blue background so it is compared to the moon like face of the beloved sham my sham means krishna so sham's face is so beautiful much beautiful than the uh, new cloud you know sometimes the cloud can be beautiful in fact sri ram krishna when he saw against the backdrop of the clouds some swans flying in the uh, uh, sky he immediately went into samadhi so also here the poet says the moon like face of sri krishna though it is dark it is much better compared to the new cloud the cloud is beautiful if especially when you see it in the rainy season but he says your face is much more better uh, the sri krishna he is praying this uh, poet he says with a flute in his hands and a smile on his lips he lights the world with his loveliness this young krishna when he used to play the flute he was hardly 12 to 13 years old and the gopis were much more older women and there were other friends of his uh, the coward boys who used to come attracted by his flute so with a flute in his hand and a wonderful smile on his lips that is the picture normally drawn of the vrindavan days and sri krishna with that he lights the world with his loveliness i mean there's so much of grace so much of wonderful music and so much of soul power 
in this young boy lad krishna he is clad in yellow robes that is how they describe he normally prefer to wear yellow robes he outshines the lightning a wreath of flowers wild flower swings from his lotus like breast to his feet so you will find most of these paintings which they do on the vrindavan days this gopis this elderly woman would uh, pick the choicest flowers from the forest the groves of vrindavan and then make the garlands themselves every day and decorate this young boy uh, who was enchanting them with these garlands so a wreath of wild flower swing from his lotus like breast to his feet so you'll find even in chaitanya mahaprabhu before the singer sings there is a tradition to make a beautiful garland so that he gets the mood of krishna that is how krishna used to enjoy and uh, his oneness with all this prakriti and all the wonderful uh, atmosphere of vrindavan and make the gopis dance to his tune with the with the wonderful notes of the flute so uh, in the company of youthful maidens he lights up the bank of the jamuna so all these gopis have come and he is uh, he is illuminating the whole passage most of the time they used to come in the evening when it was very dark but sri krishna's present presence would and live in the whole space there and there would be full of light and that has been compared to the outshining numberless moons is this moon of the lineage of nanda so it's a very poetic way uh, he says thousands of moons bright moons which are very beautiful to look at pale into significant insignificance before the wonderful music the wonderful personality of this krishna sri krishna oh friend with the music of his flute he the epitome of all excellence has stolen my heart my mind and my wisdom so the gopis they used to go into ecstasy seeing this young child uh, hardly 12 to 14 years old playing the flute with his wonderful charm and they he became a heart throb for all these people and they say he has stolen my heart my mind my wisdom they have forgotten all their duties if you see the beautiful description that is given it's not that they were uh, uh, cultivating devotion uh, slowly they were not becoming emotional it was a kind of wonderful attraction of the flute which would attract all these people living their household duties many of them would have come to collect water for their household and many of them were persecuted scolded because they often neglected their duty listening to this young boy sri krishna playing the flute in vrindavan and many of them had to face innumerable difficulties in their homes because of the father in law and the husband would scold them but still they never gave, gave up because they say uh, krishna's music his wonderful divine personality and the wonderful spirituality uh, he was the epitome of excellence has stolen my heart my mind and wisdom says ganga narayana there is another poet perhaps to whom shall i tell my sorrow o friend if you were to fetch water from the bank of jamuna you would know it so he is saying how can i tell others who have had who did not have this experience if you at least once had been to the bank of jamuna and you chanced to see this wonderful krishna under this banshi vatta vatta vruksha banyan tree singing those melodious tunes and attracting everybody there's another meaning krishna is also black but there's another meaning of krishna one who attracts krishna uh, has come from the word kri to attract to make uh, to attract people attract the minds of people in such a way that their minds remain fixed the minds their heart and everything the whole attention is focused upon krishna so that is how uh, he says if you f- happen by chance to go to the bank of jamuna he is taking the uh, readers or taking the not the readers but the people who would be listening to his poem the ganga narayana the poet is saying 
if you had been if by some chance we would have had that luck to be on the bank of jamuna then we would have known what it is then he says i could have explained unless you experience that bliss unless you experience the wonderful akarshan akarshan word or the attraction has come from the word akarshan krishna so krishna has come that way so he says how i can't explain to you unless you come to the bank of jamuna where the divine play was enacted in vrindavan he says you will not get an idea so these are wonderful songs vaishnava songs where the glory of krishna and his wonderful capacity to elevate all the gopis and all the gopalas and all the people to a different level of spirituality is being described then another song comes there are so many songs sri ram krishna is just before he starts commenting he is not satisfied with the songs there another song all the words are not given but only two lines that is dedicated to shama sham is krishna <clears throat> the dark one shama is the dark one but it is the divine mother mother kali is also known as shama because she is dark in color <clears throat> so also she krishna is known as sham because he is da- he is also dark in color so the kite of my mind was soaring high up in the sky of the feet of mother shama the rough wind of misdeeds made it f- fall circling to the ground so i was very happy because the spiritual uh, the wonder the spiritual <clears throat> the my the kite of my mind it was on a very very high plane why because it was trying to touch the sky of the feet of mother shama the feet if you see the iconography though mother kali is shown as a very dark woman i mean in the image the image is dark but if you see the feet especially if you see the feet which is lying on the chest of shiva who is lying down the feet are always painted blue the idea is that infinite blue the darkness though if you meditate on the infinite blue of the feet of divine mother you will get infinited you, yourself these are all deeply symbolic ideas and they have been converted into poems so when you say the sky of the feet of mother shama it really means the blue sky that's because the color of the sky is blue so the blue feet of the mother uh, mother shama or kali is what will give you which will focus your where when you can focus the kite of my mind the kite mind is compared to a kite which is flying normally the place where the kite should be is the sky to be on the ground is not the right place but unfortunately this kite does not continue to fly very high the different threads some others come and cut the threads and all your misdeeds will the rough wind of your misdeeds will make it fall it circles and then falls to the ground and then it no longer flies and gets its safe haven at the blue feet of the holy the sky of the feet of mother shama so after this song sri ram krishna tries to explain the deeper significance of all this way to god realization how through love gopi like love and he says it is compared to a tiger it may be appeared appeared strange to us but sri ram krishna says to the devotees just as the tiger devours devours all other animals similarly the tiger of love swallows all lo- lower emotions like lust anger and all such enemies so there are two ways in patanjali's patanjali's yoga sutra how to deal with evil emotions the six bad emotions which like jealousy lust anger pride these are all emotions which make the kite fall down so how to resist that or how to counter that patanjali because it does not believe in uh, a personal god it says the best way to deal with it is to have a counter emotion counter emotion means pratipaksha bhavana bhavana means feeling when you have a feeling of fear try to control it 
by meditating on somebody like Swami Vivekananda, for example, he was a fearless person. So when or Swami Ji himself used to say, whenever I I am in trouble, whenever I I just meditate on the heart of a lion. So lion is a symbol of fearlessness. So what you do when you have fear in your life, you meditate on the heart of a lion, trying to imagine that the lion within you, the heart of the lion, the lion's heart is supposed to be um, compared to all other animals. When the lion roars, it is supposed to bring terror into the hearts of other people. So the roar of a lion, so Swamiji says, even a person like Swamiji, he said, whenever I feel weak, I just meditate on the heart of a lion. So that is one way, Patanjali says, you count, uh, develop a counter emotion. If you have fear, then you have a counter emotion to counter that, like meditating on the heart of a lion or meditating as a child of Sri Ramakrishna, as a powerful Easter who makes you powerful. So all powerlessness goes away. Similarly, there is anger. So anger has to be calmed down by meditating on somebody who never gets angry, like Holy Mother. She is an epitome of uh, mercy, the epitome of uh, calm uh, attitude, irrespective of all the uh, reactions, which, uh, or maybe in spite of all the incidents that are happening, uh, which may make her lose her temper. She never loses her temper. So anger and everything disappears by a counter emotion. But that is how Patanjali says. But here, Sri Ramakrishna says, Bhakti is works in a different way. The tiger of love, your love is so much to the Ista, to your the personal God whom you worship through Bhakti, that all the other emotions, they fall in pale into insignificance. So when the gopis loved Sri Krishna, the love, the attraction, the tiger of love, as Sri, Sri, the gopis milkmaids had developed such love for God. So what happened? How these, these six lower emotions, how could they conquer? Fear of the husband, fear of their in-laws, fear of what the people will say if they go neglecting their duties and run after this flute of Krishna. What will happen? They didn't bother. They were not ashamed. There would be scandal because you are running after leaving your home. In those days, women were not supposed to go out. But they didn't care. They had no uh, sense of shame. No sense of, uh, in the sense, nothing could overpower them because the tiger of love had a love for Sri Krishna was so much that they, all the other things, uh, Sri Ramakrishna says, it will swallow all the lower enemies the lower emotions. So that is a, another way of dealing. Bhakti can be another way how you deal with these lower emotions. Moreover, there is the calorium of, calorium means kajal. Normally uh, in the Indian tradition, you apply certain things, uh, certain kajal or some, uh, it's known as calorium to your eyes to cool it it, it, it has a cooling effect at the same time it, it disinfectants, disinfects the eye. So there are many pur uh, purposes why kajal is applied. So this calorium of love, that means it is symbolic that your eye is full of love for Krishna. And Radha says, friend, I see Krishna filling all the four directions. So whichever way I see, seeing the dark waters of Yamuna, Yamuna's waters are unlike the Ganga. They, the Yamuna waters are supposed to be a bit dark because the whole water, if you look into the Yamuna, they are a little darker. So seeing the dark Yamuna, she is reminded, even if Krishna was not there, or seeing the black Jamun under the Jamun tree. So she is, because she has applied the colerium of love to her eyes, everywhere she sees her wonderful, loving Krishna. And she cannot see anything, even anything black, she associated, associates with Krishna. So her friend tells Radha, you are seeing Krishna everywhere because you have applied that kajal to your eyes, that black substance that makes you see or love everything black. So that is a very, very poetic way to understand this. It is so difficult to 
understand what kind of love was that sri ram krishna will explain he says people who live with lust and greed they cannot even understand an iota of the love which these gopis have for krishna people even even today if you see the amount of literature which has misinterpreted this divine love of the vrindavan gopis they were much elder most of them were quite old though there were young women also in that but sri krishna was a young boy and these people have painted because when you see from the worldly eyes this appears to be something unnatural how can there be an attraction for a purusha when the prakriti uh, so contrary to popular ideas of this this ras leela there's so much of gross or vulgar depiction of these wonderful ideas so sri ram krishna says if your eyes are impure you'll see only impurity everywhere but those who live with people who are always immersed in lust and greed and who don't even think of god even once they are bound souls they are like mangoes sri ram krishna uses very harsh language he says they are like mangoes they are pecked by crows they are useless to be offered such mangoes cannot be offered to gods eating them yourself is risky so he says if you make they say it is there was a proverb in those days that if you use the kajal made by the burnt head of a frog you will always see snakes everywhere so you will say evil minded people the world is full of evil minded people so also he says the the worldly people cannot perhaps he is trying to explain what kind of divine love the tiger of love which gopis had for the, their lord sri krishna transformed them and removed all the six uh, negative emotions from their mind and how they transfigured them to wonderful devotees that is what they are trying to explain and then sri ram krishna gives another so many examples if you see the gospel every passage or every conversation he gives something from prakriti that is why swami vivekananda said so nicely that his university was nature he did not go to any knowledge in any institution or any university where bookish knowledge is taught he could get all his lessons from nature now you see he is seeing silk worms i don't know whether he really saw a silk worm perhaps he would have because he saw how the silk worms are struggling he says bound soul souls are like this worldly people are like these silk worms they could easily come out of their cocoons if they wished but they have built their own homes own homes means building a cocoon around oneself is like building one's home so we create we create a home around ourselves and then say we are bound we are bound to our home we are bound to our world little world and maya does not allow them to escape and it all ends with death means the silk worms normally they create a beautiful home the with the silk thread and unfortunately the the people who cultivate this silk worms this mulberry tree they gather the silk worms put it in hot water and then kill this cocoons kill this cocoons kill this small uh, uh, silk worms who are in their cocoons and because they are interested more in the silk which they have weaved they are not interested in the worms so also he says liberated souls who are not under the control of lust and greed some clever are like the clever silk worms who cut their cocoons and come out but unfortunately they are very few others die in the cocoon they have created themselves so he says because of maya one remains forgetful but a few keep remind themselves of the spiritual awakening and they are not deluded by the magic of maya are not subject to control of lust and greed when the pot containing ashes from the maternity room falls at one's feet the dam dam word of the magician can do no harm uh, one can exactly see what the magician is doing this is we will discuss this afterwards because sri ram krishna goes into uh, this pot what it really means is that 
in india normally a pot containing ashes of cow dung it's a strange custom maybe it was typical typically uh, typical of rural bengal because we have never heard these things and nowadays i think because of scientific advancement these old customs are not there in nor india normally in that part of india a pot containing ashes of cow dung was kept and other substances were kept because they thought they were kept in the place where a child was born to ward off evil spirits every tradition has some superstition some people tie lemon and some chilies to ward off evil spirits so also this was the habit so he says if 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 the pot containing ashes even if it falls even if it breaks they say it is that pot should be very carefully kept the carefully kept because the magician will give you that pot and say that keep it in your room so that no harm will befall the child who is being who will be born shortly but he says if the uh, uh, one if we see we can uh, if that pot even if it accidentally breaks nothing will happen if one has spiritual awakening that is the idea they will not be deluded only those who are bound in the prison of maya they will take these superstitions seriously and they will be affected but people who are uh, filled with this tiger of love who are overwhelmed with the uh, devotion to their ishta or full of bhakti they will not be bothered by these all small rituals and other things which are meant for worldly people not for this that is what he wants to say and then he will discuss about sadhana siddha those who are perfected by spiritual disciplines and others are kripa siddhas who are perfected by the grace of god so this is another totally different topic so we will discuss it in our next class so let me see if there are some questions yeah thakur teaches the question is sri ram krishna teaches the superior devotee says it is god himself who has become everything whatever i see is only a form of god it is he alone who has become maya the universe and the living beings and nothing exists but god it seems thakur emphasizes more on becoming and manifesting rather than appearance is thakur's views close to parinamavada than vivarta now you see thakur represented one has to be very very careful recently we also got a letter from a person who was trying to classify thakur into a particular category or sect they said shankar acharya says like this this acharya says like this one has to remember that the gospel does not i am repeating again the gospel cannot be and should not be fixed or try to be accommodated in any category however hoary or however ancient it may be because when these people came and gave different theories they had one view of the truth it is like going from lower truth to higher truth so whether you believe in one sect which says god alone god is uh, what we have understood of god is the only interpretation some others will say dwaita alone is in advaita also there are hundreds of schools unfortunately that is why sri ram krishna had to come sri ram krishna had to come because of the stupidity with which indians quarreled with each other they were fighting over the husk when the rice was being wasted sri ram krishna swami vivekananda says people were fighting over the husk so the things which are to be totally ignored and thrown away very often when we cling to those things the rice which is the essence of what these different sects tell us that was not the intention it was not the intention of buddha to start buddhism neither was the intention of christ to start christianity they are later developments by indigested people who could not digest those ideas so also all the traditions when they come down the more you go away from the source all these vadas this very fact that parinama and vivarta 
this vadas are different explanations of what they thought is the best explanation of prakriti so what prakriti does what what how the, its relationship with purusha now how does to ex, how to explain creation now there are hundreds of theory some says how can things come how can things appear from nothing a scientific approach would be that this thing is already it has to exist it is just a parinama it is not the viver it's not just an appearance so you can we can go on endlessly arguing this way or the other way it depends on which school you believe and how much of logical power you have in fact they say the madhva scholars were so powerful that they proved they they could even using their logic they could say that shankaracharya was absolutely wrong and he, it cannot be because his logic is has so much of faults because they were very good at logic the madhvas or the logicians they were so adept in logic so one can use one's intelligence to say that the they will they can tell, prove that darkness is light and light is darkness just as a lawyer he, he can prove that a thief has never stolen anything if they are good lawyers so similarly in the spiritual field all these vadas that is why they are known as vadas they are opinions or they are arguments based on the intellectual logical capacity to put down another person beyond that these polemics have absolutely no connection with spirituality of any kind so whenever we discuss the gospel you have to just take it as poetry one swami vivekananda himself said i have greatest respect for these acharyas but unfortunately we try to understand the acharyas by reading the works of their disciples and when it finally comes down to us it comes in such a diluted form then we say buddha spoke this what buddha wanted to convey we don't know most of the teachings of buddha were recorded 500 years later and then there was so much of confusion that they decided to have a council they said what did buddha say this person is saying something this person is saying buddha believed in this now let us decide what did he really say so the gospel being a authentic record to tomorrow if we go on interpreting the gospel in a limited way which swami vivekananda said never do it never try to classify sri ram krishna into any category that would be the greatest misinterpretation of the gospel you have to keep it open just enjoy it as swami ji said enjoy upanishads like poetry don't go after any particular interpretation whether it is shankara they are great people they have tried to explain certain things which were required for that age but unfortunately we do not belong to that age we don't have them now to guide us so we get confused and as a result we get all these interpretations and spend our whole time discussing all these things so we have to go to the gospel as if it is a original work it was a original work and just as the upanishads are the original works they are exp- they are based on not on logic but pure experiences of the rishis that is why Sw- swami vivekananda says our i the greatest advantage sri ram krishna had is that he did not like stupid people like me he is comparing himself to a student who has gone to university to learn second hand knowledge he said sri ram krishna was saved that trouble of learning second hand knowledge and trying to understand things with that faulty uh, education so he says thankfully sri ram krishna went to the university of nature because nature never lies nature just tells you and presents facts as they are they they it, they are nature is brutally very frank so you can't say nature is kind our prakriti that is why they show the positive side of nature that is creation preservation and even kali is accepted because you can't say god is always kind or my nature is always kind when you see people being killed every day the merciless killing that is going on everywhere the suffering that is going on so a truthful person will take the idea of nature the idea of upanishads where they had no 
school to establish they had no sect to establish they just said these things are matters of the facts of life you accept it if you don't accept it you will suffer you may go on saying there is no pain there is no sorrow but buddha was following the tradition of the upanishads he said there is sorrow why do you deny this sorrow just because you have a few labels you think you'll never become sorrowful that is not how the way work the world works you may think i'll become immortal with my money but if you are really truthful you know how, what value money has what value good health has how much you will live everything these are harsh facts of life and people still want to con convince themselves so they go away from truth but sri ram krishna was like a child he saw something in nature and he did not hesitate to speak the truth because he wanted truth and truth alone he said i can sacrifice everything but truth so he saw truth if he saw a bad truth he said it is this is how mother works mother kills definitely so if she is the previous question was asked god has become everything yes it's a very difficult idea to digest and we say then what's the use of god if he gives me misery but you can't tell a truth you can't say god is always swami vivekananda when he lost his father when he lost everything no job and then his friend was singing the brahmo song where he said oh god you are merciful you are so kind you are so compassionate he said just shut up don't say all these things today i am suffering i, I mean, if you are in my position you will understand what kind of god is yours because you see he was not satisfied with a comfortable religion a religion which will satisfy our uh, foolish desires and make us happy for some time and put us into sorrow after that but sri ram krishna was not like that so we shouldn't be take very much be careful before categorizing sri ram krishna's gospel it is a unique text or it is a unique collection of experiences which are based on truth and truth alone sri ram krishna would not even to please somebody even to please somebody he would not speak the untruth whether it is bankim chandra ghosh a bankim chandra or whether it is keshab chandra sen they were all great people people would shudder to talk truth to them and point out their faults but sri ram krishna was so much wedded to truth he said i can't give truth even if it means uh, people get angry i don't mind i will speak when his brother said why don't you learn he said i don't believe in your education which gives me chawal and some little thing because he believed in what he wanted in life so he was wedded to truth so when we understand the gospel my humble request is we have to take him only at face value and to compare him to limit him to a particular sect or a uh, way of thought would be limiting that's why i said when you read sri ram krishna we will be doing the greatest injustice swami ji says universality and eternality were his uh, message and anybody who tries to limit sri ram krishna's message and reduce it to a particular sect will be doing the greatest harm to the movement so acceptance of all acceptance of all in that sense that we are move, moving from lower truth to higher truth accepting the facts of life as they are rather than trying to convince ourselves and cheat ourselves that things will be good no they will not be they will be as they were 100 years ago 1000 years ago what the upanishad said gospel also says the same thing and it doesn't sugar coat anything it just tells us the fact these are the facts if you want follow it if you don't want bear the consequences so that is how gospel makes it very easy for us if we are really sincere to find a solution that is why it is known as katha amruta the words which will give you amruta immortality it is not without any reason that sri ram krishna has called it he could have said sayings of sri ram krishna teachings his upadesh or his advice or his ideas no he said it is a nectar that will give you immortality if something can give you immortality it is the words of this child like divine personage so 
when we at least when we talk about the gospel when we talk about certain schools when we talk about shankara acharya then we can uh, have a long discussion who was talking what that is from a historical perspective they may be important but at least when we talk of the gospel it has to be based on we have to take them on face value not because it is a dogma or anything because they are so direct he has taken examples from nature he convinces you he tells you these are the truths of life you just see it is happening in front of you there is nothing mysterious nothing to believe no dogmas nothing it's a fact he just gives you examples you may believe if you believe or if you accept it you will we will be saved with a lot of trouble but if you don't accept he is fine he is very he is giving provision or giving allowance to everybody he says if you can't do that do this but this is i can't say this is good if you can't do it you do that but these are the consequences you if you want still you want that then you take that so that is how from lower truth to higher truth is the approach so we cannot categorize my answer was a little uh, long but what i wanted to tell uh, convey was that sri ram krishna cannot fit in any window or any system of thought because he was beyond thought he was just speaking from his experience just as you cannot categorize nature and say nature is good or nature is bad or nature is like this nature is nature there is uncertainty everywhere you can't say anything is good or this is this way is good this way is bad no it it it, it presents itself uh, with the uh, bare truth the naked truth uh, which nature shows and shows all the possibilities and that infinite possibility and then finally the upanishad says there is no solution within the realms of nature you have to just transcend nature and we have found that truth the upanishad rishi says we have found that truth which says that no matter how much you try you have to transcend nature if you want to be saved and that is what sri ram krishna repeats in his uh, wonderful gospel so i take your leave om shanti 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 hi hari hi om tat sat sri ram krishna arpanam astu thank you balaji namaste pranam thank you swami thank you